there we go. It used to be a button at the top and they took it away. Um, so again, my name is Beth Lander, the Managing Director of Paxville, and I thank you all for coming here today. I am going to introduce everyone participating in this session of what we're learning, implementing a harmful language audit. And I can't minimize Zoom when I'm recording this meeting. <laughs> so let me see if I can find my, yes, I can find everybody's name and introduction. So first will be John Andres, director of the John J. Wilcox Jr. Archives and Library at the William Way LGBT Community Center. And John will be discussing the challenges that collections face when documenting groups whose terminology, terminology changes and adapts over time. Second will be Faith Charlton, Lead Processing Archivist in Special Collections at Firestone Library, Princeton University. And Faith will review the audit conducted by Princeton University, which helped inspire the one conducted by, by Paxville. Um, and Faith will discuss how archivists at Princeton are implementing elements of reparative description. And we are delighted that Betts Cow Pope sorry, Head of Archival Operations, Technical Services for Archives and Special Collections at Harvard University Archives, Arts and Special Collections is joining us. We are very excited, Betts, that you're here. Betts is also the chair of the SAA description section and will showcase the section's inclusive description portal. And then our last speaker will be Sam Thierry, born digital archivist at the Kislak Center and University Archives, University of Pennsylvania. Sam is also the co-chair of the Penn Library's wide DEI and Discovery Working Group, and who is charged with addressing harmful language and library catalogs and archival finding aids. Sam will speak about how the results of the Paxical Harmful Language Audit and the progress made by the Penn Working Group informed how the metadata for the Harvey Finkel Photograph Collection honored the communities and individuals represented in Finkel's work. So, with that, uh, I will turn things over to John. Oh, and one other thing, everyone will speak and then we'll have time for Q&A. If you have any questions during presentations, please put them in the chat. And my co-host, Allison Mills, and I will do the refereeing at the end of the program. Thank you, Beth. Um, I'm gonna just share my screen here, let's see. I think that's the one we want. Uh, can folks see that? Go to full screen. There we go. Okay, so um, uh, as Beth said, I um, am the archivist at uh, the Wilcox Archives here in Philadelphia, um, uh, LGBTQ community archive. Um, when we participated in the audit, at the time of, of uh, the audit, we, we had 61 finding aids in PAA, and um, 46 of those finding aids uh, got some sort of hit on them, one or more hits. Um, there were a total of 422 hits, and a hit is where a particular term is, um, is found within the finding aid, either in the title, uh, in a title such as a file title or a series title or something like that, or in uh, the notes, uh, the notes fields. Um, for us, the most hits came from a small, small number of collections. Um, and uh, I think there's some, maybe some reasons for that. Um, the largest was our periodicals collection, um, but then we also had um, uh, some other uh, personal collections, individual or family collections, and our Pulp Fiction collection. I think in the case of Pulp Fiction and periodicals, there's a lot of um, titles of either books or periodicals that are using language that is either dated or um, uh, particular to the LGBTQ community. Um, and uh, and then I think in the case of the personal collections, um, those happen to be three of the ones that, they're not the only ones, but they are three that are extraordinarily well described. So I just think there was more opportunity for hits. <laughs> um, so the audit found uh, 
terms uh, in groupings, which it called match rules. And um, this is sort of the order of, of the ones that it found for us. So um, LGBTQ terminology was at the top and then gender and so on. Um, I guess that's not really totally surprising for our content. Um, the top terms that it found um, included gays, homosexual, homosexuality, dyke, sexual minorities, and so on. Um, and I'll get into a little bit on some of these terms uh, in a moment, um, but that sort of, you know, shows you the the lay of the land for for our finding aids. Um, so when as I went through the results. Um, I tried to divide them up into categories and the categories I came up with, I don't know if they'll be useful, but um, I started with things that I thought were false hits. That is, it's a word that is being used, not in a way that, um, you know, that a potentially problematic term might be. So um, the city of Plantation, Florida is cited in, um, you know, the, the name of a magazine. Um, or the word hick, which falls under socioeconomic, which a, a term you might want to avoid, um, actually is short for Hickok, for Lorena Hickok, um, having to do with a musical that was written about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and the journalist Lorena Hickok. Um, so those are some examples of false hits. Um, then I sort of came up with a category of potentially problematic terms, but used unpro um, unproblematically. And here, um, for instance, the term daughter falls under gender terms. And I can only surmise that that term is in there um, to call attention to um, the possibility that, um, that uh, gendered terms such as daughter, wife, sister may often be used with a without uh, you know completely saying who the person is, giving their name, um, or 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 might be um, you know not given the credit um, that perhaps the person deserves. Um, so just sort of as a general um, you know highlight to look at it and see see what's going on there. But in this case, um, you know, I felt like. Um, this is a collection of a man's letters to his daughter, and, you know, this rightly says that he addressed them to his daughter, Amy Rosenberg. Um, and then uh, under aggrandizement, um, we had um, the use of the word successful, which might be overused um, for, uh, in the case of many um, uh, cis white men, um, but in, in this case is used to describe a lawsuit, um, which, you know, is either successful or not. Um, so unproblematically un used. Um, there were a lot of terms that fell into titles. And, um, you know, rather, regardless of whether they are problematic or not, um, you know, it's not likely that we're going to change terminology um, in the case of, of a title. Um, so for instance, here, I, again, I'm going to surmise that the a preferred use of um, the word deaf would be to follow it by person, the deaf, you know, a deaf person. Um, So-and-so is a deaf person. Um, and I'm, I'm, taking a stab at that, so I may be wrong. But um, in this case, we're talking about a title um, of a group that uh, is formed by deaf people who created the group name. Um, and then here, another title um, of a magazine called Drag, the International Transvestite Quarterly. And here I would surmise that transvestite is, in the, is, is a term that is called out um, conceiving that it may be uh, dated, that it may be inaccurate because it might be being used to describe uh, a transgender person. Um, but in this case, again, it's um, a title that um, was chosen by um, the people making this magazine. Um, so here um, is, uh, are a couple more. Um, 
uh, under LGBTQ, the term dyke, um, Apple Dyke News is a newspaper, or Big Apple Dyke News, I guess it is. And um, uh, uh, this is, you know, uh, both a title, but also a term that um, is not necessarily considered a slur. Um, I think it would maybe depend on how it was used, but um, many lesbians will use this term quite uh, proudly. And then under race terms, um, the term Asians, again, I think um, using the plural term to describe a group of people um, might not be the, um, you know, the best thing to use in, um, you know, in uh, prose, but here again is the title and the title chosen by these people. Um, and then we get to some that I think actually are used problem problematically. Um, this one uh, uh, under aggrandizement saying the Civil, Civil Liberties Union, American Civil Lib Liberties Union is the nation's foremost guardian of liberty. Woo! Um, it turned out that this was a quote, um, but in fact, the entire um, bio his note was, was a quote. And so, um, you know, that definitely sig sig signaled to me that this is something we should take a look at. And then um, we've got here um, uh, the word sexual minority. Um, this is a term or terminology that was used quite a bit in um, earlier decades, um, but is not used nearly so much today and might be substituted with something like LGBT community or something like that. Um, a couple more that are used uh, pro uh, problematically, um, the term homosexual. Um, yeah, this whole, I don't even know what this whole thing is describing here. The someone is theorizing that the church turned him homosexual. Um, but I think um, uh, in this case, um, well, I don't know. It probably needs a lot of uh, uh, inspection to see what's going on here, um, but probably preferring to say gay man. Um, and the, then the thing with gays as plural, um, saying lesbians and gays in Philadelphia, um, rather than perhaps lesbians and gay men, and also lesbians is misspelled in our finding aid. Um, so just sort of a couple, a few um, sort of conclusions here. Um, uh, I would say that out of all of those terms that we, um, you know, received in the report, we're probably considering considering editing around 30 of them. And most of them fell into the category of homosexual, uh, gays, sexual minorities. Um, those were probably the highest um, of the ones that I think truly are uh, problematic. Um, but it was interesting that the terminology does not look for the word queer. And I can only presume that we've decided that that word has been uh, you know, thoroughly reclaimed and used proudly by LGBTQ people. Um, but, you know, not everyone would agree with that. Um, I'm certainly fine with it, um, but I know that there are others who are not. Um, I also found that it didn't pick up on uh, sort of antiquated terms um, for sexually transmitted diseases like venereal disease. Um, it didn't pick on, up on the term transgendered, which is often used in place of transgender and seems dated. It did not pick up on the long version of the F word, though it did find the short version. Um, and then I thought also um, some other areas which might be considered in the future, um, uh, language around suicide and death, um, sex work and sex workers, drug use, um, how we describe HIV and AIDS and people uh, living with uh, HIV. And then some things that I thought, you know, surely, or at least I don't know how they would be picked up in an automated audit, but should be on people's minds is uh, dead naming of trans individuals or misgendering in the use of um, pre preferred pronouns. And then the final little bit of suggestions that I have is that I think, you know, ultimately an audit, and if we do it again, an audit should come with guidance on how to use. And so I think that will be, you know, definitely something we'll, we'll want to be working on. Um, I'd love to see a glossary of terms and their pot potential problematic use. Um, I think when uh, discussing individuals, obviously um, it's best to use the terminology that they prefer if that is known. And then um, I think, you know, there's definitely the case of considering uh, when to use language that's current at the time of the materials, 
So, you know, something that is from 1968 uh, in a finding aid, I might say, um, might refer to a group as gay and lesbian rather than LGBTQIA+, um, simply because that's not language that would have been used at that time. Um, and then, of course, you know, obviously it's important to consult with groups who have truly done work on their own terminology, um, you know, rather than maybe just asking, you know, your cousin who happens to be gay. Um, not bad to get that person's input, um, but that should probably not be the only thing to help you make decisions. And then, of course, just always keeping in mind that words and their meanings change over time. We might have preferred using sexual minorities in the past, but now we more often use something like LGBTQ community. Um, but in the case of queer, which was once considered offensive, um, that has in many ways been reclaimed and is not considered so. Um, so I will leave it at that and um, pass it on to Faith. Thanks, John. Let me get my slides. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay, great. Um, so like Beth mentioned, my name is Faith Charlton. Um, I'm the lead processing archivist for Special Collections Firestone at Princeton University Library. Uh, and I'd like to thank Pax Skull's Harmful Language Working Group for inviting me to present on the inclusive and reparative description efforts at Princeton. As a way to formalize archivist grassroots inclusive and reparative description efforts, members of the archival description and processing team formed the Inclusive Description Working Group in 2019. It currently has seven archivists and a member of IT who assists us with programmatic metadata projects. Predicated on the fact that archives are not neutral and that we work in a profession that is deeply tied to legacies of colonialism and white supremacy, the working group's goal is to describe archival materials in a manner that is respectful to the individuals and communities who create, use, and are represented in the collections we steward. We aim to change our practices to be more inclusive and to make us as archivists more cognizant of how our own internalized biases impact our work. We use a reparative framework in order to address these past failures, meaning that we're actively prioritizing collections, people, and subject areas where there has been the most harm done and directing our limited labor and resources there. We also seek to develop mutually beneficial collaborations with communities represented in our collections. In addition to publish publishing a public facing statement on archival language, one of the thir first things the working group did was to conduct an audit of our finding aids to determine what collections had descriptions with harmful language. In addition, in addition to reaching out to colleagues to ask for anecdotal evidence of problems, a significant portion of this audit involved automation. We created an X query script to query Princeton's EAD XML data of our finding aids. The script incorporated regular expressions to search for specific lexicons of harmful terms, which we developed in consultation with our public services colleagues. Categories included terms related to slavery, race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, region, indigenous peoples, colonialism, women, gender and sexuality, bodies and ability, and war. We also ran an audit to locate aggrandizing terms and biographical notes as part of an effort to address the use of euphemistic and laudatory language for collection creators that often obscures negative aspects of their lives. This example from Dorothy Berry, who's the digital curator for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, demonstrates how the fallacy of neutrality and description especially how euphemistic and laudatory language used to describe a collection creator can, for example, obscure the lives of people they enslaved. It's essential to note that the lexicons we used, which informed Paxil's description audit um, that included additional terms to what uh, Princeton had used, are intended to flag terms so that we can go back and, like John was saying, evaluate how they were used in context. It was not a simple find and replace operation. 
Our survey generated a large amount of data to develop redescription projects and also served as data we could use to demonstrate to administrators where the problems are and advocate for prioritizing remediation. We also plan to review the results of the PACSCAL audit to see how it compares to ours, especially when we engage in work related to specific topics or collections. While we aim to prioritize user reported issues and other changes that most directly impact users, archivists can choose where to focus their redescription efforts based on their areas of knowledge or their capacity to engage in various ways. Our description audit and continued discussions with staff and stakeholders inform a regularly updated redescription projects list where working group members can volunteer for and track progress on specific projects. Depending on the topic and one's own personal connection to it, redescription can be emotionally taxing and it's important to make sure folks work within their own capacity. The working group created a set of guidelines in researching how others in the field are approaching this work to help inform our inclusive and reparative description efforts. They're intended to help us describe and process new and legacy collections with heightened awareness and sensitivity. We consider this to be a living document and continue to add to and revise it. Some core values reflected in the guidelines are listed here. When possible, we prioritize language that individuals and communities would use to describe themselves. We try to balance the preservation of original context with an awareness of the effect of offensive language on our users. One example of this is that in most cases, we're keeping creator supply description to preserve evidence of their biases and past terminology, but we are revising language used by former archivists to match our evolving professional standards. We attempt to discontinue the perpetuation of inequalities in finding aids, such as by avoiding writing biographical notes that elevate the accomplishments of wealthy white men and suppress the voices of women, people of color, and other marginalized groups. We're also moving toward writing description in the language of the creator, materials, and users of a particular collection, rather than defaulting to English language finding aids. And we're being transparent and accountable about our actions by preserving evidence of changes to finding aids, such as maintaining past versions of description and providing mechanisms for users to report problematic description. We do all of this work with the understanding that description work like all archival work, is iterative. Descriptions are in no way final or static and can be revised as many times as appropriate. I'll mention a few ways or projects, a couple of which came out of the results of our description audit in which we've tried to repair legacy description and create more inclusive and affirming description. An area with very glaring cases of dehumanizing and racist language is in our finding aids for collections documenting slavery. To redescribe these records, we focused on replacing harmful language, adding names of enslaved people who are often the subjects rather than the creators of historical records, and including contextual information that might help genealogists and other researchers identify them. This next example is about improving the discoverability of women who served as creators and subjects of historical records who were erased by previous descriptive practices. In this case, staff determined that the Willard Thorpe papers actually contained both the papers of Willard and Margaret Farron Thorpe, his wife, who was a scholar, author, and journalist in her own right. Among other revisions, notably, we updated the collection title to make this clear. Archivists have also worked on a couple of large-scale projects to identify and provide fuller names for women who had previously only been identified by their husband's name. We also look to community-informed guidelines when library standards use out-of-date language. Over the past several years, we've been acquiring archival materials pertaining to the U.S. government's incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Rather than using euphemistic language like Japanese internment, evacuation, and relocation, we use terminology guidelines created by Densho, a Japanese American community organization that focuses on this period of its community's history. A more recent addition to our inclusive description guidelines is the application of content warnings. The goal of these warnings is not to restrict or limit access to content, 
but to alert users to the presence of potentially harmful content and to give them an informed choice about whether to view it. Acknowledging that warnings are an imperfect solution, we aim to mitigate harm. In concert with our public services colleagues, we developed a rationale for the use of these warnings, as well as suggested criteria and examples for when and how they should be applied. Our criteria was largely adapted from internal documentation on content warnings created by staff at Tufts University. In our content warnings, we aim to be specific and concise about what users will encounter and to avoid broad statements or assumptions about how users will feel. For example, we suggest a warning such as, this story contains racist textual and graphic depictions of indigenous people as opposed to contains distressing material. We collaborated with our colleagues in IT to add cover images to harmful digital content in our image viewer that users can click through. This is an example of a content warning we use for digital materials, but we're also applying warnings to analog materials as well as to harmful description found in the finding aid itself. As you'll also see in this screenshot, researchers can submit information about harmful or offensive language or any physical or digital materials that lack description, context, or warning by use warnings by using the finding aid sites report harmful language or content form. Submissions are routed to staff through the library's application for managing reference interactions. Feedback from our users is an integral part of how we approach redescription work. Even in our efforts to create accurate and respectful description, we won't always get it right and language norms shift over time. A sustainable approach to an anti-oppressive to anti-oppressive description means that we need to center people in all of our metadata practices and continue to adapt our strategies as things change. Given this new application of these features, a small group of IT and special collections staff that I'm a part of recently conducted a focus group study on content mediation and archival description and the use of content warnings. As those in the archival community have emphasized, the need for user experience work has become even more critical as the archival field has turned its collective attention toward DEI and social justice related work. Our group is currently analyzing the data we collected and we hope to publish and present on our findings within the next year or two. Uh, in wrapping up, I'd like to note that work that Princeton's inclusive description work has been doing, as well as work being done at other institutions will be the focus of a forthcoming SAA publication, which I think is going to be released this year, but I'm not totally sure. Um, thank you. And I will turn it over to Bips. Thanks, Faith. Um, it's always exciting to see what folks are doing at Princeton. I am going to take a minute to share my screen. Can everybody see my slides? Awesome. All right. So hi, everyone. And thank you again so much for having me. Um, my name is Beth Scope. As Beth said, I'm the current chair of the Society of American Archivists Description Section Steering Committee. And in my regular life, I'm the head of archival operations for technical services for archives and special collections at Harvard. It's the newly integrated unit that serves primarily Harvard University archives and Houghton Library. Reparative description is very much part of my responsibility in that role. Um, and I oversee a team of five archivists who meet weekly to work on reparative description for Houghton Library. Wearing my description section hat today, though, I'm going to focus um, on two efforts around inclusive and reparative description um, done by the description section, um, most specifically our inclusive description portal of resources, and then our ongoing blog series on inclusive description. And I'll put links um, in the chat when I'm done. They're also on the presentation, so when this goes up on YouTube, they're already in there. Um, so the um, SAA description section maintains a description portal. Um, it has various kinds of topics and at about 2020 we introduced an inclusive description portal to the site. The intention was to always have regular updates to that and so in May of 2023 the steering committee put out a call for additional resources and plan to revisit and assess our existing list and all of our new submissions. 
Our goal was to make sure that the list is up to date, given the expansion of scholarship in the area since 2020, and to make sure it's really a go-to guide where people can look for resources. We received many suggestions, and upon that decided we needed to create a more formal working group to carry out review systematically. That group was led by Ashley Lott Gosselar, the then immediate past chair of the description section, as well as Scott Kirike, our web liaison, Kate Morris, then a member at large, and Phoebe Nobles, then our secretary, and myself, serving at that point as vice chair, chair elect. We divided up the list of both previously submitted and newly submitted articles, which was over 100 articles to look through. Uh, we each took a set to assess, and then we met every other month to to sort of update each other. We explained our reasoning for why a resource should be on the site, might not be the best fit, or was kind of an open question, and then we had a discussion. We had to come to consensus on each one, and though there was never any contention, we did have some pretty lengthy discussions about various resources to ensure that we were all in agreement. So the criteria for the materials you'll now find on the inclusive description portal um, were accuracy, and our assessment of that was, does the link to the resource work? Is the resource maintained? Is the date of a last review clear? And have we categorized the resource appropriately? And I'll talk about categories in a minute. Duplication, when possible, we chose to point to longer lists of the same type of resource. For example, the cataloging lab provides a current list of statements on bias in library and archival description rather than listing dozens of individual statements on the page. We did have like seven to 10 of them listed and now we just have one, plus the link to Temple University Library's harmful language statement as it was among the first and is often seen as the inspiration for others. And we wanted to give credit where credit was due. Representation. We tried not to overrepresent or privilege a single institution or author. The group of us realized that particularly folks who had been on the description section um, tended to work for predominantly white institutions and tended to have shared our own resources. So making sure that we had um, equitable sort of resources by different institutions and authors and making sure that no author had sort of out of date representation uh, that we were keeping their most up-to-date scholarship available on availability. We wanted to make sure that everything we were linking on the inclusive description portal is freely available online and not behind a paywall. That means that there will be some articles that might seem sort of important to inclusive description that don't appear on the portal, but we wanted to make sure that everything was available to folks, no matter whether or not you are part of an institution or a member of SAA. And then completeness. Again, if a creator has expanded upon ideas that they might have presented early on in a slide deck or a webinar in a more detailed publication, we chose the latter publication. And throughout the presentation, you'll see some screenshots of the portal just showing the kinds of things that we have available on it. Uh, so as of this spring, we completed our review and there are now 70 resources across eight categories of material on the inclusive description portal. Those include case studies, controlled vocabularies and glossaries, cultural protocols, manuals and guidelines, research and theory articles, resource lists, and then the sample statements about harmful language and archival description. We had really lengthy conversations about formats and what formats are appropriate, and we kind of went on an all-inclusive um, method with this. So you can find videos of presentations, you can find articles, you can find working papers. There are websites, there are Google Sheets and Docs, wikis, linked PDFs. <clears throat> Sorry, losing my voice. Um, slide decks, there's a full gamut of formats. Again, we only included resources that are freely available and publicly available at the time of review. We really wanted this to be a go-to guide that could be used by everyone, no matter your institutional affiliation. So the portal is a living resource. It is our goal as a steering committee to keep it up to date, respectful, and in alignment with SAA core, SAA's core values and code of ethics. You are always welcome to email us at saadescriptionsection at gmail.com with suggestions for additional resources. At this point, we are just doing a rolling review. Um, so we'll respond regarding their status and then we'll get them up online if they've been assessed um, to be appropriate for inclusion. So I did, again, you'll see on the screen a list of 
this is just like a, a quick screenshot. It's a lot of resources and they are, it's just one big list. We also assessed sort of how to sort of make it more user friendly and decided that any sort of categorization by topic or anything like that might be more limiting than it would be useful. So I did also want to mention um, the description section's other kind of significant work around reparative and inclusive description, which is our ongoing blog descriptive notes. Um, and again, I'll put the link in the chat when I'm done. We actually have an open series relating to inclusive description, which dates back nearly to the blog's first instances. The first inclusive description blog post went up March 30th, 2021, and it was by Sharon Mazota on the topic of guidelines for using Wikidata as a controlled descriptive vocabulary within a reparative social justice framework. Um, I will also say that if you go to the link that I'll be sharing, you will see my face yet again as I wrote our most recent addition to the series. Um, but since that time, there have been about 20 blog posts published around inclusive description. And the, there are a really big range of topics that relate to this from um, guidelines at a variety of institutions for reparative description, descriptive projects, whether digital or finding aid content related, um, institutions implementing the protocols for Native American archival materials, some broader projects too, um, such as the Indigenous Snack Project, Snack being social networks in archival contexts, and the Program for Cooperative Cataloging's Metadata Justice work for Indigenous communities, as well as some workflow-related content. The blog posts often serve as great kind of case studies that can be taken home to one's institutions or projects that could impact our work. Um, and I will say I'm mentioning the blog as it is an area where you can find informative content, but also because it's a great spot for sharing projects like the one Paxil is taking on. Um, and we're always looking for contributions. But beyond that plug, it's also a great and ongoing resource around topics of inclusive and reparative description, which is freely um, open and accessible online. It is not linked in our portal because we didn't want to do that much of an advertisement for ourselves. Um, but those are kind of the two ways that the description section is providing information around inclusive description. So if you have any questions about the blog, if you'd like to consider writing for us, um, it's the same email address, SAA description section at gmail.com. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the process for the, the portal or for descriptive notes. If you'd like to reach out to me more directly, my email is also on the screen. So thank you so much and I will stop sharing my screen. I think I'm next, is that right? Okay, great. Give me one moment to share my screen, if you will. Okay, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Great. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Beth and uh, fellow presenters. Um, and thank uh, thanks to Chris Clement for handling the technical aspects of the audit as well, and to everyone joining us today or who are watching the recording of our presentations. My name is Sam Sphiri, and I am the Born Digital Archivist at the Kislak Center and University Archives at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm also the co-chair of the DEI and Discovery Working Group, which is a cross-campus um, group uh, that addresses description, any harmful language in any of our um, description in our catalogs and finding aids and other discovery. So uh, I wanted to talk today uh, about how the Paxical Harmful Language Audit helped us understand the state of our metadata, our legacy collections, but um, which will be use useful for metadata re remediation projects. But this talk today will actually show an example of how our department interpreted the audit to prevent harmful language from occurring in the first place, or at least understand how to approach writing metadata from an informed perspective using a collection, um, specific collection and a digitization project to show how the audit influenced the behavior and attitude of pen libraries more generally. In 
In 2020 and 2021, the Cassack Center received the photographs of Philadelphia-based photojournalist Harvey Finkel, a self-taught documentary still photographer who has documented social, economic, cultural, and political issues, large, largely focusing on historically underrecognized communities and activism in Philadelphia, both focusing on social injustices in the city, the country, and the world. Given the importance and interest in Finkel's work, curator Lynn Farrington and I proposed to have Finkel's photographic prints digitized and made freely available online, resulting in a successful cross-departmental collaborative effort that included catalogers, arch archivists, digitization specialists, and members of the DEI and Discovery Working Group, and the results of the Pax School Harmful Language Audit to ensure that the metadata honored the communities and individuals represented in Finkel's work and the success of the digitization project more generally. Penn Libraries is proud to host the Harvey Finkel photographs through the Kalenda Digital Repository. So giving you the option to, if I can do this, I'm going to put the link to the finding aid in the chat and also a link to the digitized photographic prints as well in the chat. So you can choose to ignore my slides and scroll through those if you'd like, or stick with me here in the slides. So briefly, I just wanted to set the stage with some of the stakeholders and other important aspects to do with the project uh, resources and the like. So of course, the donor Harvey Finkel himself and the communities uh, which he photographed are, uh, I would say, the primary stakeholders as they're th those who we would like to honor with um, describing. The Special Collections Processing Center, which is the department where I work, um, where all the archivists and rare book catalogers in the Kislak Center and University Archives work. And as well, the DEI and Discovery Working Group, which is, as I mentioned before, a cross library group that serves as the governing body to review issues consults subject matter specialists and sets priorities for action to address diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in Penn Library's online catalog and other discovery environments. And also the uh, SETI, the Schoenberg Center for Electronic Text and Image Lab, which is where digitization specialists work. And of course, as a resource, the Paxical Harmful Language Audit itself. So the physical materials, about 58 linear feet of uh, photographic prints, contact sheets, negatives, and slides were processed by a group of archivists and the finding aid was published in 2023 uh, in August. Given the importance and interest in Finkel's work and its potential usefulness uh, for events, including natural hist National History Day and pertaining specifically to activism related activity in the Philadelphia area, and also as a good faith effort to fulfill Harvey's own wishes to have his photographic prints online. Uh, curator Lynn Farrington and myself proposed to have Finkel's photographic prints digitized and made freely available on Penn's Kalenda Digital Repository, where the scanning tasks would be done by in-house technicians at SETI and uh, assigning myself as the sole metadata technician for the project if it were accepted, which thankfully it was in August, 2024. The organizational method for digitizing the materials was to group the photographic prints um, by the file level description and the finding aid, where each file level description represented a, we would we called it a volume of photographs, uh, regardless of how many photographs were inside. So to give you a sense of the scope, it was about 11,400 prints that were grouped into 172 volumes. And just to say the prints were uh, both the front and the back were scanned. So the number of images is actually double that, but there were in fact uh, about 11,400 prints. So once the project was, um, I'm sorry, the, 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 the project was accepted in 2023 and the digitization project was completed by August, 2024. And I'll just briefly mention that putting on my digital archivist hat for a second, I'm currently now just packaging up the last bits of the 
about 221 gigabytes of digital photographs, which are not prints. They're born digital photographs taken by Harvey with a digital camera. So this is an additional chunk of, of photographs. But from here on out, I'm really just going to focus on the digitiz digitization project itself. So as I mentioned earlier, Harvey requested that we make his prints available online uh, in an effort not to rely on his own website um, and you know having to maintain uh, that domain. Um, and as a, also, as I mentioned before, uh, Lynn Farrington, curator of the collection, and I uh, submitted our proposal that was accepted in December 2023. But once the project was accepted, understanding that the scanning tasks were all going to be left to our digitization specialists, I was left as the sole person writing the metadata for um, all what would be 172 volumes that posed, I think, potential harmful language issues, which, I'll be honest, sort of frightened me that, you know, it would be going up on a, you know, publicly available website and, you know, seeing as how we're meaning to champion uh, Harvey and his work, and of course the communities that he photographed, I really wanted to get it right. So while Harvey did in fact provide, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Well, Harvey did in fact provide description for much of the contents of the material. Some of those materials described were uh, described at the time the photographs were taken using language that may not be acceptable, acceptable today. And conversely, we talked through how, um, how to describe materials using terms might pe people might use while, when searching, an issue that we think more generally when we uh, are selecting subject headings in our finding aids and catalog records and in finding aids as well. So due to my involvement with the DEI and Discovery Working Group, as mentioned earlier, I felt very comfortable bringing this project up with that group as well as my own unit, uh, ending up calling two separate meetings with any members of either of those groups uh, that wanted to join me in figuring out exactly how to describe this material uh, in the open text description fields and also to select uh, appropriate subject headings using and referring back to the Paxical Harmful Language Audit as a reference, among other resources. And after the completion of the project, some of us have since presented this methodology of this project to some departmental meetings and have been encouraged to review the metadata and um, resubmit better descriptions, more accurate descriptions over time, potentially bringing in members of those communities to identify uh, the people represented and so on, which is you know, my interest in sharing those links um, at the beginning of this talk is sort of an ongoing effort to expose uh, you all and the community to this collection and really to openly uh, admit that I would really, or really encourage you to scrutinize this and give me any feedback you may have. So some takeaways we had uh, really being that harmful language audits are useful for both remediating and preventing harmful language from being created in the first place, um, serving as a basis for preventing harmful language from being created, serving as a resource for metadata creators to be aware of their ability to create harmful language without even meaning to, really just trying to inform people uh, beforehand so that we're not faced with the same kind of remediation effort that we may have to perform on our legacy collections. Um, we also uh, did a lot of this group or this work as a group, and we've determined that well-planned group projects are effective in getting projects done quickly and efficiently, but also to draw on a wider range of expertise and serve as additional motivation to complete projects as well. So here again are the uh, links to both the finding aid and the digitized prints in Kalenda. And I, of course, thank you all for the opportunity to talk with you about this collection. And I'm proud to have led this project um, using the Paxical Harmful Language Audit 
uh, results as a key resource leading to what I think was a successful project honoring RV and the communities involved. And I'm very proud of this project and how it transpired as a sort of group, library-wide group project, but I'm still not actually sure about the description of the material in the collection. And again, would invite you to scrutinize the words and submit your feedback to me here um, at my email address here. And while we're here, I'll also add a link to a current exhibit of Harvey Finkel's work. This, these are prints that I don't believe are in our collections. Um, and this is at the Woodmere and it runs through January 5th, 2025. So please go check that out if you're interested. Um, yeah, so I think I'll leave it there and open it up to questions as I think I'm the last presenter. Well, thank you to Sam and John and Faith and Betts for wonderful information. I was taking many notes to pass on to the folks at the Harmful Language Working Group for consideration of what we'll be doing in the future. And now I would like to open things up to questions. So if you want to have any questions or comments, place them in the chat and we'll identify you by name, direct it to the correct person, and hopefully wrap things up with some good dialogue. And for those of you watching on YouTube in the future, I will try to place all the links shared in the chat somewhere in the YouTube document so you have it. So folks at the Swarthmore Friends Historical Library, oh, it's Celia Kaust Ellenbogen. We're working on the socioeconomic status category and have found resources from journalists, but are curious if anyone knows of resources for or from archivists and librarians. I'm guessing from the silence from our panelists that nobody has any wisdom for you, Celia. Anything on the inclusive description portal related to that, Bets, that you can think of off the top yes. of your head? I am currently scanning it. I actually was wondering if somebody, since I'm a little bit outside of it, what all is involved in the socioeconomic status category? So I can be thinking as I'm scanning this list of 70 things. So, so this this category um, came up. I think it was not part of Princeton, was it, Faith? Yeah, it was. It was uh, created by the DEI committee itself, and I am going. Um, let's see if I can find it very quickly, and I can share some of the terms with you. If everyone gives me one moment. So in the category of socioeconomic status terms, the committee included white trash, yuppie, high class, low class, upper class, lower class, ghetto, poor, impoverished, snob, elitist, dirt, mud sill, peon, trailer trash, undeserving, shiftless, lazy, welfare queen, cracker, oaky, hick, hillbilly, and redneck. My first comment is, can I get your list of things you searched so I can expand what we're looking at at Harvard? Because honestly, like, I don't want to say those are great because they're horrifying, but I also have the sneaking suspicion that that list, it would be very handy for us. Um, and we have a list of terms, but I don't think it actually includes very much on that. Um, and yeah, I will say I don't actually see anything on the description portal that would be specific to that. It's possible that there's like in the guide, the guidelines, the manuals and guidelines that another sort of institution has looked at those terms in particular, but I will admit I don't see anything. And if anyone finds anything, please submit it so we can add it. Uh, Celia includes in the chat brokenphilly.org and APA style for bias-free language under socioeconomic status. 
And I, I, I will say the concept of, of, of having some kind of warrant or basis for the creation of a set of terminology has really come up in another Paxil grant project called Black Joy and Resilience, but it, it did not it did not come up as part of the DEI committee's uh, development of, of terms in addition to the ones that, that we, we glommed from Princeton. Does anyone else out there have any other questions or comments? Actually, I'll also say if anyone out there has any suggestions that you'd like to see out of PACSCAL as the Harmful Language Working Group continues on this in terms of guidelines, best practices, future professional development opportunities, you can either share them right now in the chat or you can send them to me. And I will put my email address in the chat for the three people out there who probably don't already have it because I would love to know. Um, I'll just I'll just say um, for Sam, um, we've worked with Harvey uh, a lot here at um, William Way and in the archives and have some of his prints as well. Not not anything of the order that you do. Um, and a lot of communities that that our community or communities we intersect with, um, you know, have been a part of those prints. So, um, you know, if there's a desire on your part to be reaching out to portions of different communities, um, I'd be happy to help um, make introductions or what have you. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Beth, if you don't mind, I, I think I sent my links directly to you. So I might paste them in the chat to the whole group at this point, if that's all right. Yes. Are there any other comments from everyone in the audience? I see that um, Celia Swarthmore has also commented that um, uh, Caitlin at Swarthmore would be interested in uh, to see best practices uh, around incarceration. I, I is, have a note to that effect, yes. And yeah, Caitlin may great. be asked to participate in that. I know there were a couple of people who, who are part of Paxil member institutions who outside of their work um, have, have, have done volunteer uh, efforts in providing books to incarcerated people um, or who have done other volunteer work in that sphere. And I may ask them to, to participate as well. And if anyone else has similar experience um, and they'd like to join in that conversation. I can speak briefly on our approach to uh, incarcerated as a term and related terms, um, if you'd like. Sure, we have a couple of minutes. Yeah. So this was one of the, I guess you could say, concepts that I brought to the group meeting with the DEI and Discovery Group and my own department. And we reviewed, um, essentially reviewed the terms in uh, the LCSH terms, such as prisoners and incarceration, imprisonment, and weren't particularly happy with the uh, authorized terms that we found. Um, so we created two local terms um, because the material speaks to both. Uh, it, it appeared as though people represented were at the time currently 
incarcerated persons, which was a term we used and created locally, and also formerly incar incarcerated persons, as the photographs seem to suggest that there were people um, who were uh, no longer incarcerated. Um, and I think that the way things are structured, and I'm not a cataloger, so I'm not probably going to get this exactly right, but that we opt for being more inclusive in terms of adding as many terms as we can for searchability, but then suppressing some of those terms um, so that you don't see them. So any harmful language, uh, such as prisoners, which is not a term that we really felt great about putting, um, if, if people were to search by prisoners, they'd still find a resource. Um, whereas uh, the terms that we would show would, would be incarcerated persons or from formerly incarcerated persons. So that's a general approach that we take to our library catalog. It doesn't apply to the digital or, um, repository, the Galenda material. Um, so we kept it, I think, I don't remember exactly what we use, but a variety of terms for searchability, um, but, but trying to use and rely on the terms that we feel better about um, when repeating terms. Well, thank you, Sam, and thanks to everybody who's added comments to this in the chat. And um, I will be sure to save all the links that were given in the chat. And once the recording of this session is up on YouTube, I will go through Eventbrite and send the link to the YouTube program and all of the links in the chat to everybody here. And with that, I will say thank you to everyone who's attended and especially to John Andrews, Faith Charlton, Betts Cope, and Sam Sphery for their participation and their thoughts um, and their experience. It's greatly appreciated. And hopefully I will see everyone at a future Harmful Language Working Group sponsored program. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Beth. <laughs>